All right, here we are with part two in our series on beer, and we're going to talk about yeast in this next section. Yeast is actually a fungus, and many of you are familiar with things that are fungi. Molds are fungi, and mushrooms are fungi, although we don't eat molds. Most of us do eat mushrooms. A fungi is just a eukaryotic organism, and all that means is that its nucleus is enclosed with a membrane or a cell wall. If you remember at the beginning of the semester when we took the shell off of an egg, that's what a membrane looks like. And that cell wall or membrane provides strength and protection for what's inside it. The yeast evolved 2 billion or so years ago. One thing that's different about yeast than a lot of other things that live on Earth is that they mutate very easily. They share genes with their neighbors. Essentially, if they bump into the yeast that's next to them, they're sharing some DNA information. If you can imagine, if human beings did this, if every time you touched or bumped into somebody, some of your DNA was exchanged, you could envision that maybe the world would be one big melting pot and we would all have the same color skin and some other stuff, but it doesn't work that way. And it turns out it doesn't work that way for fungi either. But what it does mean is that there are no pure yeast, that every yeast that's out there is a mixture but there are still many, many varieties of yeast we will see. Diego Lipkin, who researches in this area, says we now know that many brewing strains are a mix of different species, and that's why, depending on the yeast you choose, you get a little bit different result. Um, part of that is because of something called brewery domestication, that because we are using these yeast in the same way over and over again, they basically learn, and the genes that are less efficient wind up being turned off, and the genes that are more efficient wind up getting turned on. So, sounds like evolution to me, doesn't it? So, did we discover yeast? Actually, yeast was here from probably the early beginnings of the planet. We said two billion years ago. Um, how did we get to know about yeast? It's probably a better question. Way back in 1516, the Germans wrote the first food safety law that the world knew because they were trying to keep their beer safe. So it was essentially a set of rules of do this and don't do that. But it made no mention of yeast because we didn't know what yeast was at the time. And it was written kind of like what we're going through today with the coronavirus, that we fear what we don't know, and the rules kind of evolve as time goes on, and hopefully they get better and better and better with time. Now, in the mid-1600s, over 100 years later, Anton van Leeuwenhoek, who invented the microscope, was studying beer because I guess he saw some things that were interesting to him. And he saw what we now know as yeast cells in the beer, so he made some drawings of them. And at the time, and still today, the Royal Society of London is a collection of scientists who are very well-schooled. It's very hard to get into. And many of the famous scientists you know, the Bohrs and Einstein of the world, either belong to the Royal Society or were even fellows, which is a higher designation. The interesting thing is that at this time in the mid-1600s, no one understood the drawings. They had no conception of what a yeast was, so they did what anybody would do if they didn't understand something. They ignored it. And this didn't have devastating consequences, but it is kind of interesting because normally scientists don't ignore stuff. Now, going on, in the late 1700s, another hundred years later, Antoine Lavoisier, who chemists recognized the name because he was the discoverer of oxygen and hydrogen. They had been there all the time, but he figured out what they were. He did a lot of work on the conversion of sugar to ethanol and carbon dioxide. We now know that as fermentation. Um, and still, yeast wasn't called the yeast until the mid-1800s when Theodore Schwann actually picked up Van Leeuwenhoek's drawings and figured out what they were, that they were yeast. Schwann also continued to do research and found out that yeast can reproduce asexually. They don't need a partner. They can do it all by themselves, which if you're yeast, is a pretty convenient thing to do. He determined that yeast actually eat sugar, which again, for us today, is a good thing, uh, but just interesting in the yeast world. 
He determined that yeast need nitrogen to survive. It's part of the mechanism that keeps them going. And whether the source of the nitrogen is an amino acid, which would be like a DNA fragment, I guess, or ammonia or ammonium ion, as long as it has nitrogen, it's good to go. And in that way, there's a lot of nitrogen in the fertilizers that we put on plants and grasses today. So nitrogen is important to biological systems. And the thing that's really important to us is not only do yeast eat sugar, but they excrete ethanol. So the ethanol is a waste product of the yeast. How convenient for us. Now another famous scientist in the mid-1800s, Louis Pasteur, published a series of papers. He did work on a lot of different systems, and it turned out that he determined that yeast could ferment other things. You didn't have to start with sugar uh, to get the yeast to do something. But if you started with something other than sugar, you could get glycerol or succinic acid or butyric acid. So he made a contribution to fermentation scientists. Now, all this work in the mid-1800s is really the beginning of the study of how energy can be produced from living things. Now, you may remember Back at the beginning of the semester, we talked about the fact that you can't make energy. You can rearrange molecules, you can rearrange energy, but you can't make energy. And that's really what we're talking about, is taking something like sugar and turning it into something like ethanol. Now, you can burn both sugar and ethanol, but there's some other things going on that change the energy. So we're rearranging molecules to get energy sources. So in the late 1800s, Pasteur publishes a book on beer and fermentation. He actually published a significant book on wine. But that's not the story for today, and this is not the end of our story today. Um, Emil Christian Hansen, who worked at the Carlsberg Brewery, a famous brewery that's been around a long time, and a friend of his, Robert Cook, were walking through the plant one day and sampling some of the goods, and there was a bitterness in the product, and there were some off odors going on at the plant. And of course, you want to figure out what's going on with your product, because three-fourths of it weren't good, because only one of the four strains they were using were producing good beer. Well, that strain became Cerevasus Car Carlsberg genus. And is it a new species? Well, maybe, maybe not. But here are some other... Um, observations that they made that are kind of important. The traditional yeast, um, Cervaceae, floated on the beer that was in that. Their yeast, or what came to be their yeast, the Carlsberg genus, sank during fermentation. So if you put the same thing in two vats, and one of them floats and the other one sinks, they must be different, right? Yeah, but not so much. Well, that observation led to a bunch of research and got us to this point, where today we know that the yeasts that are used to produce ales, which are a type of beer, those yeasts float. And why do they float? Because their cell walls or their membranes repel water. They're hydrophobic. They don't want to be in the water. And in the part of the vat that has the least water, that would be the surface, because half of the surface is air and half of it is water. The other thing that happens is um, these yeasts stick to carbon dioxide and they wind up floating up to the top, because you know carbon dioxide likes to escape from a liquid. Now, lager yeast that are, made to, uh, that are used to produce lagers happen to sink. They have these protein sugar projections that are like Velcro. When they hit another one, they stick together. They are also polar and hydrophilic. They love water, so they sink. The interesting thing is when you take those projections off of those yeasts, they don't stick together. They still sink because they're hydrophilic. They love water. Brewers, um, being a practical bunch, they like sinking yeast because they're easier to recover. And brewers a lot of time will take these from one batch and use it to make the next batch and the next batch and the next batch. A little bit like a starter is used to do uh, sourdough bread. So in summary, yeast are single-celled microorganisms. They're fungi. They're hundreds of millions of years old. And there's about 1,500 species that have been currently identified. 
that means there's probably at least several hundred more that haven't been identified, places like the rainforest where humans don't travel very often. Saccharomyces cerevisiae, which is the typical uh, yeast that is used to make beer and it's used to make bread and other things, has a simple task. It converts carbohydrates or sugars to carbon dioxide and ethanol. And because of Saccharomyces cerevisiae, we have alcoholic beverages and we have bread. Now, other yeast species um, cause infections in humans, as some of you have had yeast infections know. You can use yeast to generate electricity in fuel cells or to produce ethanol for biofuels. Um, so why is this one yeast strand, Saccharomyces cerevisiae, the one that we have we are using to produce beer and bread. Well, it's been around humans a long time. We keep feeding it plants and seeds and other stuff in large quantities. We feed it very generously. It's like you feed an animal and it gets bigger. We cultivated it. Um, we gave it what it needed when we wanted it and we became one with it. So it's kind of part of us and it does exactly what we want it to do. Again, there's an evolutionary line in here that we're not going to go into because it's beyond the scope of what I'm trying to teach you guys right now. We have a few slides here on malting and fermentation because that's the next thing we need to talk about. So winemaking is about grapes or things that are like grapes, strawberry and other things where there's easy access to sugar. Beer and booze, on the other hand, they usually start with seeds. And those of you who eat seeds and nuts know they are not sweet. They are loaded with sugar, but the sugar's in a little bit different form than we need to talk about a little bit today. These seeds, some people, biologists call bombs of life, because what is actually in a seed? It's typically an embryo and a nutrition packet. And if you think back to the egg, if that egg got fertilized, what would be in that egg? There would be an embryo, the yellow part, and a nutrition packet, the egg white. So what these seeds are is a biochemical plant for growth and development. If we put the seed in dirt and we water it and give it air and we give it water, bang, it detonates into a plant. And that is energy. So seeds contain energy and life. It's just an interesting way to think about the seed. Now, if you look through this list, you're going to find grains, hops, cereal, uh, corn, rice, barley, all these things are seed kind of like things. And why are they important? Well, if we crack them open just enough to get inside, we can get to what's known as the endosperm. The endosperm is starch. It's starchy food for the embryo. It's that uh, packet that it's going to feed off of as the plant's developing. It's protected by layers of enzyme-making cells. It's got a hard shell. You know how seeds are. Um, and you can watch this YouTube uh, video that I have linked for on our Canvas page so that you can get some more insight into this whole process. Um, edible seeds are good for humans. Uh, of the six major plant parts, seeds are the dominant source. And as a global food source, seeds are important. Cereals, legumes, nuts, and spices are all things that come from seeds. So the list of edible seeds that human beings eat is pretty substantial. Grains and cereals like corn and rice and oats and barley and wheat. Pseudo-cereals like quinoa and flaxseed and sesame. These are a lot of the in things that uh, you kids these days like to eat. Legumes, peanuts, garbanzo beans, soybeans, lima beans. And then nuts, acorns, almonds, Brazil nuts, cashews, and the like. So there's a lot of stuff going on here, and we are going to focus on barley when we start talking about malting and fermentation. So come back and join us for part three. Thank you.